All right, we are live, folks. Recently, there's been a wave of stories coming out that paint a pretty bleak picture of our so-called green future. From high energy prices and uh, energy shortages to dictates about how we should live our lives and whether or not you should even have kids, climate alarmists seem to have no shortage of bad ideas. We're going to be talking about all this and more on episode 375 of the In the Tank podcast. All right, welcome to the In the Tank podcast. As always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall. And joining me today, we've got uh, what is going to be our normal crew, I think. We've got Jim Lakely, VP of the Heartland Institute. How are you doing today, good sir? I'm doing really well. Uh, I have way behind on my Christmas shopping, but hey, it's only December 8th. I got plenty of time. You got some time. You got some time. Justin Haskins, uh, fresh off his adventure, cutting down his own Christmas tree. Oh my uh, God. He is the dir- <laughs> you are the uh, what, what are you, director what are you of the Socialism here? Research Center. How are you doing, good sir? You trying to make me go back into the, the therapy again? I just got out. I've been That's in right. therapy since I cut down that damn tree. It's been right. nothing but hell. Nothing yeah. but hell. That was, that was the worst experience of all time. We should do an episode just on that experience. Well, that's what you get for uh, growing your carbon footprint by cutting down a tree. So that's what you get. Also, uh, we've got Chris Talgo, who is the editorial director here at the Heartland Institute. How are you doing today, good sir? Doing good. Got my fake tree up uh, like I always do. That's and, right. For uh, the environment. For the environment, of course. I'm very, very concerned about that. And uh, I just want to say that I like to do my Christmas shopping the day before because I do all gift cards. That's that. That's a I, have a, I have a question. I have a question for Chris. Sure. Chris, how many young Chinese children were required to build that tree of yours? How many? Uh, over over under five. Well, well. So I've got a I've got a, a plastic tree. <laughs> I think as it was well. made in America. <laughs> I got a plastic tree as well, but it dates back to like the seventies. So you know that's oh. that's as green as yeah, it gets. It, it takes tiny little hands to put all of those little needles on the tree. So you know, good point. Yeah, that's why I have my two year old repair the trees. There you go. The image. Well, uh, soon audio will be AI. AI will be doing all the work for us. So audio only listeners. Uh, I always have to put this message out there. Those of you that are catching the audio only on a Friday or later, you can join us a day earlier on Thursdays at noon central time. Join us live uh, streaming on Rumble and YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. You can join the conversation, throw your comments and questions in the stream. Perhaps we'll show your comment on the screen. Maybe we'll answer your questions on the fly. Also, I mentioned this uh, for the first time last week that we were going to start. Um, we we're going to start shifting the in the tank show, the in the tank podcast show. Uh, for the audio only listeners, everything's going to be the same. But uh, for the YouTube listeners, we're going to be shifting it off of the Heartland Institute main channel and on to Stopping Socialism TV. So for this week, I think we're streaming on both channels simultaneously. But you might want to get in the habit if you're not already in watching our show on Stopping Socialism TV at the beginning of the year. Next year, we're going to be solely on that channel. We're going to open up a whole bunch of different ways for fans to interact with us. Uh, We're going to try to grow the community over there. Um, also one other thing to note is that we have a, our, uh, what is it? The 15th international conference on climate change. Yeah. 15th coming to, uh, Orlando, Florida on February 23rd through the 25th. we already have tickets for sale. So you can go to heartland.org and at the top, there'll be a thing you can click on to buy tickets or find more information, or you can go to climateconference.heartland.org and see this website that Andy's got shown on the screen right now. 
find all types of different information. Jim, anything you want to say about any of those things I brought to the table already? No, it's, it's going to be a fantastic conference, as, as all of these have been. If uh, if you think you know what's really happening to the to the planet uh, when it comes to climate change, uh, you probably do know a lot more than most people in the media, but you could really get a uh, uh, an expert. You can get all the best experts in the world to really tell you what's going on. So you'll learn a lot about what sea level rise is actually doing, um, what the drivers of climate change are, uh, and it's all data-based. And we're also going to have people, uh, somebody here in the in the chat, uh, here on YouTube, asked if Alex, Alex Epstein is going to be speaking at our conference because we're going to be dealing, obviously, with a lot of energy policy there as well. Uh, he has spoken at, at previous conferences. I have invited him to speak at this one, and we are, uh, we're, we're working on maybe trying to figure out a way to, a way to work that out. But, uh, you know, he's an example of these uh, of people that are real experts on climate and energy policy uh, and the climate science. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun. And you meet a lot of people who are also very interested in learning what's going on in the planet. So uh, I, I've gone to, uh, I started at the Heartland Institute, I think when we were on our second climate conference and uh, I've learned so much and it, it's it's really something you shouldn't miss. If, you, if you're able to be down in Florida in February, who doesn't want to be in Florida in February? Uh, hmm. We'd love to see you there um, uh, at, at the conference. It'll be great. All right. Fantastic. And yeah, this episode is going to be primarily climate uh, policy focused, but uh, there's a story I want to briefly talk about. And uh, this is to do with Elon Musk releasing the so-called Twitter files. Uh, this is about the conservative censorship in general and the censorship of the Hunter Biden laptop uh, specifically. And of course, like a lot of stories do, this came out like the hours or maybe the day after we recorded our last episode last week. So currently the story is about a week old. Um, so I don't want to dedicate a substantial amount of time to talking about this because, you know, in the in the scheme of things, in the 24-7 whatever news cycle, like this is an old story. But it's a topic that we've covered pretty extensively on this podcast. So I feel like it would be pretty weird if we didn't have anything to say about it. Um, so just very briefly, and I'll open up to, to you guys to, to comment on it, but, uh, it appears as though our suspicions were correct. Twitter took down, uh, the post about Hunter, uh, Hunter Biden's laptop story, censored it like it was the worst type of content imaginable. Um, and then you can see in these emails that were released where the Twitter people are trying to justify the move to take this stuff down after the fact. So they acted first and then they were like, all right, now we have to justify this. So you could see kind of where their bias was coming in with all of this. And the reporter uh, that was releasing all this, what's his name? Matt, Ta Matt Taibbi. 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 Yes. Yep. He, he makes a, a solid case um, uh, that this move and many others were very partisan in nature. He showed a bunch of communications where the Biden campaign seemingly routinely reached out to Twitter with a list of tweets that they wanted taken down. And then the responses to some of these to, to some of these uh, uh, inquiries were just, oh, taken care of, like, thanks. Like, it's just a routine thing. So, Jim, I'm sure that you've been following this closer than I have. Do you have anything to add to the conversation that hasn't been said on a million podcasts over the last seven days? Uh, no, I'll just say, look, there's a, a wonderful book by Molly Hemingway uh, of The Federalist called Rigged. And it is about the 2020 election. And, uh, you know, you may, some people say the election was stolen. Here I go again, uh, getting a span, <laughs> putting these words together. But th this this shows how the system was rigging elections to make sure that doing everything they could to make sure that Donald Trump was not reelected as president. Um, and so I think one of the the there's going to be more of the Twitter file stuff coming out. I think one of the real interesting wrinkles is that uh, the FBI knew about the Hunter Biden laptop since I think at least 2019. They knew that Ru that Rudy Giuliani had gotten possession of the information on the laptop from the, the, the store owner because they were monitoring Ru Rudy Giuliani on a trumped up uh, some sort of foreign espionage investigation. So the FBI knew all this stuff. And then in Oct right before the story is broken by the New York Post, which they knew was going to happen any any day now, they went to Twitter and Facebook and said, hey, be on the lookout for a Russian misinformation uh, campaign specifically dealing with Hunter Biden. Wow. And then when the story breaks, what does Facebook and Twitter immediately do? They take it all down. So the, the FBI knew this was happening. Uh, 
and set it up so that it would be suppressed. That is, I think, the heart of the real scandal here. It's not just a media scandal. It's a, it's a government and intelligence uh, scandal in the United States. It's a big mess. And what a surprise. Our corrupt corporate media isn't really covering it at all. Yeah, well, that that was actually going to be my question to Chris, because Chris watches the CNNs and the MSNBCs so that we don't have to. Uh, did this story register on those networks at all? Nope, not one bit. Uh, Fox <laughs> News actually did a analysis of the uh, media coverage, and it was zeros across the board. Uh, Jim, you know, hit, hit the nail on the head here. Uh, but I would also say that the intelligence uh, community in in mass, uh, you know, was uh, defending the... Um, the move by Twitter and the move by Facebook. Remember, 51 intelligence officials, including James Clapper, Michael Hayden, and on and on, they come out and said, this is classic Russian disinformation. They never looked at the laptop. They never interviewed the uh, repair shop uh, owner who you know had the laptop. They came out and just said, this is Russian disinformation without any evidence, without looking at anything. And um, remember, Twitter actually said that the reason why they buried this story was because it was quote hacked material that's just not true it was never mm. hacked material hunter biden left his laptop at a mac repair shop after after a couple months uh the mac repair shop man had ownership of the laptop according to you know like the the terms of the agreement so it's just it boggles my mind that the fbi has had this now since december of 2019 yet no charges have been filed against hunter biden or anyone involved in it yet the people who were trying to expose it, whether it's Rudy Giuliani or uh, others, you know, in the old Trump sphere, how come they've been arrested on trumped up charges? It mm -hmm. is just we you know what? We live in a totalitarian state. You can call it a republic, but we do live in a totalitarian state because the government has the ability to come and crush anyone who, you know, dares defy their, you know, their uh, narrative. Yeah, Justin, uh, like I said at the beginning of this, we have uh, a lot of topics to get to. But I, again, I just felt weird not talking about this, at least briefly. So do you have any uh, anything to add to this this topic? Uh, yeah. So the only thing that I the only thing that I would add that hasn't been said, you know, a million times before is uh, that one of the most interesting we don't know everything. We haven't come up with everything in the Twitter files. A lot of it has just been sort of selectively leaked. So there's a lot more information we're going to find out over time. Uh, there's basically been a very small group of people who have had the opportunity to review it. At some point, the, the public will probably get a chance to review some or all of it. And when that happens, I think you're going to get a flood of additional information. Uh, but of the things that have been revealed uh, so far, one of the most interesting things is that there's a, a member of Congress uh, named Ro Khanna, Mm. who is uh, a representative from California, far left-wing representative from California, a Democrat. And interestingly, uh, this representative reached out to Twitter in the midst of the ban on, um, on the Hunter Biden laptop story and basically advocate, said to him, you know, you're making a huge mistake. And, and suggested that they need to reverse course because, you know, if the New York Times had done this on a war crime story or mm -hmm. something like that, you wouldn't be doing that. And we don't want to set this precedence. And, and you know, good for this person. I mean, I'm really, I mean. It's, it's a guy, by the nor way, in case you were wondering. Not, well, I mean. <laughs> I'm not going to say what you I never know nowadays, <laughs> but, but the, 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 the bottom line is the bottom line is like in the world that we live in today, where it seems like so many people on in the democratic party are eager, eager to ban and censor, uh, people on the right institutions on the right, uh, media outlets on the right at every opportunity. Good for Ro Khanna for stepping up and saying, you know what, this is really bad. What you're doing is setting a very bad precedent. Right. Uh, I don't know what happened after the fact. I don't think they did anything as a result of that. But um, at least there was an attempt made to say this. This actually, if if applied to the left, would hurt mm -hmm. us too. Sure. And I think that that's actually something that really hasn't gotten any attention at all, but is pretty interesting. Um, and so. Good for Rokana. Yeah, and I get the sense that this isn't the the last batch of information that's going to be coming out. There seems to be drips and drabs of other stuff that's uh, coming out that's categorized under this Twitter files thing. So, uh, you know, if, if there's more stuff that breaks, especially 
maybe right before an episode. Uh, I think that we'll have more to talk about in future weeks. But Donnie, just one 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 last uh, point to make here. Jo- yeah, Jack Dorsey said that he had no clue that any of this was going on as the CEO of Twitter, which I think is an indictment of just how dysfunctional Twitter is. Yeah, and I will say, just reading through like all of the different the first wave of threads is that uh, yeah, Jack Dorsey's name was va- like completely not a part of the equation. Like he was not, not bought into the yeah. loop in any of this. Yeah, right. and and let me just let me just wrap it up by saying th- what's on the Hunter Biden's laptop should still be a national story because it gave it gave people insight into what is the Biden family business, which was his his layabout drug addicted son getting lots of money to funnel back into the family uh, just because he was Joe Biden's son. That is an enormous scandal and still needs to be reported on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Are you I telling mean, me Joe Biden's the big guy? Come yeah, on. I was going to say, there's still a question about that. I we think it's Chris that. Christie, but, uh, you know, that's... Could just... be anybody. <laughs> yeah, could be Chris Christie. Could be could be yep. anyone. Could be me. Could be a homeless man on the street. <laughs> could be Jim. <laughs> could be anybody. Yeah. <laughs> who knows? Who's, who's the big guy? guy? Who is the big Leave guy? Leave in the comments who you think the big guy is. That's I'm curious <laughs> about that. All right. Well, let's get to our main topic of discussion because there are several different facets of this thing that I want to look at here. Over the past couple of days, I've seen a number of, um, we'll just call them troubling stories that revolve around climate change and the supposed solutions to climate change. So the first thing that I have in my show notes, I think, um, is like an item talking about high energy bills that Americans are going to be paying as we get into the winter months and and as you would expect, you know, they're going to be high. But, uh, but you know, we've talked about this a million times. I, I don't think there's anything new that we that we can bring to the table when it comes to high energy prices, whether it's here in Europe and what's causing them, the terrible policies that are leading to all of these high energy prices. We've, we, we've went over that ground numerous times. So I want to uh, immediately just move to something a little bit more juicy. So any objections to that? Uh, do you have, anyone want to say anything about high energy prices or should we move to uh, immediately to a, a little bit more of a juicy item? I got my first energy bill for the, you know, cold winter months and it was not pretty. <laughs> yeah, ditto. <laughs> not pretty. <laughs> yeah, ditto. <laughs> and I'm leaving my thermostat a lot colder than I want it to be. Uh, yeah, right, let's complain right. about that in February. Let's get on to the news. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So like I said, I want to move on to something a little bit more juicy here right off the bat. So uh, a new report. Um, was recently released by an organization, a couple of organizations, some that I've never heard of, one called C40, which is like a collection of 40 different cities that want to be super active on climate change action or something like that. One called ARUPT and uh, the University of Leeds. So these are all very well-established, well-funded organizations. Uh, They're, as far as I can tell, well-respected in the realm of climate alarmism and all of that. So they released a report titled The Future of Urban Consumption in a 1.5 Degree Celsius World. So the report's executive summary starts with this statement. This report by C40 Arupt and the University of Leeds assesses the impact of urban consumption on climate breakdown and explores the type and scale of changes needed to ensure that C40 cities reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in line with internationally agreed climate safe limits. So the report explains a number of things that citizens residing in these large cities need to do to ensure that their cities reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So these include things like reducing the number of clothing items that you purchase, dietary changes, reducing numbers of flights, reducing car ownership, etc. Now, of course, these are all things that we've heard about before. Reduce your carbon footprint, right? Recycle more. You know, what's new here? Well, the report goes a step further than just listing a bunch of generalities. They boil it down to numbers that every person needs to abide by to avert, you know, a climate disaster. So the report categorizes uh, the required individual actions down to progressive targets by 20. 30 and ambitious targets by 2030. But, you know, the world is ending soon if we don't act. So let's be ambitious, shall we? So under the ambitious targets, and uh, Andy, if you're scrolling through here, you need to go a little bit further into like section six where they get to the the very specific things. Uh, But when it comes to clothing, you can only purchase three new clothing items per year per person. This is the ambitious targets to make sure that we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions down to internationally agreed upon limits, right? 
When it comes to your diet, you can only consume 16 kilograms of meat per person per year. Oh, wait, no, sorry. That's the progressive target. The ambitious target calls for, that's right, zero kilograms of meat per person per year. The same thing goes for dairy consumption. So basically, you have to go vegan, uh, according to this, to this, uh, to this report. The, the, for vehicle ownership, the progressive target is 190 vehicles per 1,000 people, or fewer than two out of every 10 people get to own a car. And under the ambitious target, zero private vehicle ownership. That's right, everybody. No more cars for you and me if we want to hit our greenhouse gas targets here. Also, the, uh, the, the report outlines what the optimum lifespan of these cars in the ambitious target would be. And that is 50 years. So they want anyone that does <laughs> own a car, this car has to last for 50 years. And I don't know about you, but I don't see many cars from 1972 driving around the streets anymore <laughs> here in 2022. But again, this is what uh, our, our global elites are kind of foisting upon us. That also talks about your air travel. The ambitious target would have people only taking one short flight, which is about 930 miles. So, Justin, unfortunately, I won't be able to come and visit you every three years per person. So, so again, under this, this green future for society, you can only take one short plane trip every three years. So, uh, I mean, there, there's a bunch more in this report, but uh, I'm curious of just your initial reactions. Jim, you're the one that brought this report to my attention. So what do you think of when you when you hear some of these numbers? It's well, the first thing I thought of is like if you're putting this report together, if you're a researcher at the University of Leeds and you're like, uh, you know, actually, the, the purpose of this, as you said, the C40, uh, I guess that's 40 of the biggest cities in, in, a, in the world. And this is kind of an outline of what mayors can do. You know, mayors like our Lori Lightfoot here in Chicago, what they can do to help fight climate change. And they can impose these kinds of restrictions on their own people, uh, like some kind of dictator, I suppose. But the idea that by 2030, now what that's uh, seven years from now, in 2030, it should be, if they reach their ambitious goal, that everybody on Earth, everybody, that includes the Kardashians, are only allowed three new items of clothing every year. Now, when I heard that, I thought, well, I'm going to invest in underpants futures because if I could only get three uh, artists of clothing new every year, it's going to be underwear, you know, <laughs> Good point. and Good I'll, point. I'll deal with everything else, I suppose. But like when you're putting this report together, oh, yeah. And then and then flights um, every three years, you're allowed to fly a total of nine hundred and thirty two miles uh, total round trip everywhere. I mean, that and of course. John Kerry's not going to adhere to that sort of thing. Lori Lightfoot's not going to adhere to that sort of thing. None of our global elites are ever going to adhere to any of these things. It's always, every single time, what you little person, what you plebes, what you useless, um, you know, mouth breathers on earth uh, have to do in order to save the planet. Everybody else, the elites will be able to do whatever they want. They will never have any reduction in their standard of living. Uh, but I, I thought, was there nobody was there even among climate alarmists, was there nobody who looked at this report and said, hold on, hold on. You're serious. Three articles of clothing a year. Really? That's what you say we need to do to save the planet. And then if we're only going to go to the progressive goal, it's six articles of clothing per year. Nobody who produced this report and publicized it and shared it around said, guys, nobody is going to do this. One. <laughs> And two, if we publish this, people will never take us seriously again. This is absurd. This can't happen. And there wasn't a single person anywhere involved in the production of this report who had an inkling of saying anything reasonable like that. And so that is actually a real window into just how far gone these climate cultists are, that they can't even see how on its face that is so absurd. And, and again, uh, we're allowed 16 kilograms of meat per year. That's not just beef. That's all meat, which includes fish, I suppose, but definitely chicken and, and beef. Uh, and then eventually, their ambitious goal, zero. No mm. meat at all. So you think it's reasonable, guys, to tell the world we all must go vegan in seven years. And nobody says, uh, you know what? Maybe we can uh, scale that back a little bit. Nope. And they put it in the report. It is absolutely mind-bogglingly dumb. Uh, but that just shows you how far gone these cultists are.
Yeah, there, there's a comment over here by uh, Doug Troyer saying, who really thinks that this is serious? And, I, and, and I'm curious of what his mindset is. Uh, I'm not too familiar uh, with this commenter here, but because I, I when I first saw this, I, I kind of thought it was satire. Like, there's there's no way that this is true, because the first thing I saw was a snapshot of the idea that, like, you could only purchase three items of clothing a year. And I thought it was a joke. But then, like, I've read enough. Well, I mean, I read this report, too. But I've read enough of the World Economic Forum. I've been on their website. I've seen that they have whole sections of their website dedicated to the unsustainability of the textile manufacturing and all of that. Uh, I've seen all of their articles talking about how, you know, we have to allow crickets and and insects to be part of the protein uh, when it comes to, you know, protein consumption worldwide. So this is not out of step with the stuff that we've already talked about uh, numerous times on this podcast. They're just being upfront about it. So, Justin, I'm curious for your uh, initial initial takes on on what we're going through here. Yeah, you know, I actually don't have a problem with this report at all. Um, I, I I really I really like this report. This, Justin this only report, buys two things of clothing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I basically work from home. I don't go anywhere. This gets me out of a lot of traveling to see people I don't really want to see. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to go to the office ever again. So, I mean, this is all pretty good. Um, but the thing, the, the reason I I say that is because I'm a big believer in when it comes to the climate change stuff, the really radical climate change stuff, we should be talking about this. We should be taking the arguments that the far left are, are making and we should l- apply them logically to policy. Okay. And that's exactly what these people are doing. Right. What they're saying is if we're all going to die, if we take that as the foundational starting point, we're all going to die from climate change. What do we need to do in order to immediately stop that from happening? And the the so-called solutions that they suggest in this are probably right in the sense that if we really are going to die and we really are going to try to stop it using the supposed methods that will stop it from the left, then we would have to do all of these crazy things by 2030. Right. And I look at that and say, great. If that's the position that you're running with, good luck because no one's going to, no one is actually going to do those things yet. That is what it takes. So when, so when Joe Biden, and the thing that bothers me is when Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, they get up on TV and they say, it's an existential threat. It's a crisis to humankind. And if we don't, you know, uh, change things now, then and they talk in all these generalities. They talk about it as an existential threat, but then they don't actually propose only buying three things of clothes in a year or not traveling more than 900 miles or whatever. Like they don't they don't propose those things. Why? Because they know that if they did, they would be totally rejected out of hand. So these people are actually saying, well, if we are really going to do this, then this is what it looks like. And you know what it looks like? Awful, really right. bad. Nobody wants the world that the University of Leeds in this report <laughs> is building. And so that's what I want. I am so, I am I am not uh, tired or frustrated of these kinds of things. I love these reports. The things that bother me are the 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 things that you hear from Joe Biden where he calls it an existential crisis, but then doesn't treat it like an existential crisis. right. If you really believe it, then you got to be out there. Uh, why isn't Joe Biden every single day out there saying the things that are in this report? Why? What right. if he really believes we're all going to die, which is what he says? Why doesn't he? Why isn't he advocating for these same things? That's the stuff that really bothers me. So I love this. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now we. I mean, I'm as likely to use this. I'm more likely to use this than people who are on the left because I can say, look, this is what their world looks like. Does it sound good to you? And yep. who's going to sign up for that? Yeah, far far too many people think that combating climate change just means switching from those dirty, polluting, outdated fossil fuels to new, shiny, high-tech solar and wind and all of that. And then once right. we do that, then we could just keep living the life as as we want. Yes. And it's like, no, this is the world that is consistent with that worldview. Yes. Not that the, one. The, that's such an important point. The underlying argument that is, or the uh, the underlying assumption that's made 
by everybody in the debate is we're deciding between basic, everything stays the same either way. It's just, where do we get our energy from? And do we have to pay a little bit more to save the world or is, and that's it. That's the choice. When in reality, that's not the choice. In reality, the choice is we blow up everything and society as we know it crumbles to the ground or we keep living the way we've been living where everybody's living longer, having better lives, quality of life is improving, poverty is, is being reduced. Those are the choices. And right. that's never how the debate is framed, even though that's the logical uh, if you treat it, if you take the underlying assumption and you apply it logically to policy, this is where you end up, where the University yeah, there, of Leeds is going. There's a there's a comment. Uh, I think that's very important. There's a comment that says uh, from engineer guy SE, will cats and dogs have to go vegan? And that's a good question. And and yes. is your is your allotted meat that you're allowed during the progressive uh, uh, metric there? Do your cats eat into yours or do they have their own metric i we need a new report on that yeah Chris. also are, are we even allowed to have them would i think be a good question because good they're point. just unnecessary mouth more mouth breathers as jim would say they're just more mouth breathers out there right uh yeah just a couple, yeah, couple quick comments i think you know jim and uh, justin you know uh really analyzed this you know pretty much in full but uh the first thought that came to my mind when i saw this and started reading about it is this sounds like they want to uh have the pandemic lockdowns now just for forever so oh, i think that this i think that, that this thought. yeah okay so i mean i i, just, I think that they are predicating this off of the uh, lockdowns where you couldn't really travel in a car because there's nowhere to go there's nowhere to buy stuff from so you didn't buy anything blah 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 the other thing that i think that this represents to me is uh part of the great reset agenda so this is right up here in justin's alley um the part of the great reset agenda in my mind is that they want to push the masses into these cities because they can control people when they live in cities. Sure. They cannot control people when they live out in the rural areas because they can't control where they you know, go with in their cars and this, and this kind of stuff. So I think that this is part of the bifurcated society that they want to implement where those people who live in the cities and who obey them and who follow their orders. Yeah. You can function in society. You can have access to, you know, a bank, you can have access to a job, blah, blah, blah. But if you're one of those people that dares defy these, you know, these orders that they are uh, trying to enforce, well, good luck trying to survive in, in, you know, in, in the outskirts of the cities. You know, I think that that's what this is really about. I think that that's yeah, and, a big part of this. And, and let me be clear there. There's nothing uh, in this report that suggests that any of this stuff would be mandated by force of government or anything like that. So I, I don't want to uh, put uh, put any extra, you know, juice in this that that's not you know, specifically stated in there. But we do know just from being aware of all the stuff that goes on in the world that uh, when it comes to government, uh, you know, usually it starts off with with voluntary actions. Then it moves to encouraging you to take the right steps. Then it moves to incentivizing uh, you to comply. And then punishments for non-compliance and then it's straight up force so that's the flow chart of things when it comes to governments <laughs> well, uh, intervening in something but that's so how this things is just work, that first step but that's how things work in ordinary times but as we've seen in the past couple of years when they declare a crisis that means that you can you know uh dismiss and ignore the constitution and you know ordinary uh governmental procedures and just say it's an emergency we have to do these things to prevent the emergency whether it's a pandemic or, or climate change and as we saw during the pandemic, a lot of people at the World Economic Forum and, you know, these elitist institutions said, this is the blueprint. We have to do this after the pandemic's over, but applied to climate change. So that's why I think this is part of a much grander uh, strategy at play here. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, and then you brought up, Chris, you brought up the idea that this is kind of reminding you of uh, the, uh, the COVID lockdowns and all of that. So I want to bring up this other article. This is from Fox Business. And uh, this this, you know, you would think that, um, you know, for all of those that comply with these things, you know, like that there, there is going to be some portion of people that go ahead with all of this and they'll do these things, even if they hate it. And then they'll complain about the people that don't fall in line. And, and we know there's plenty of these people that we saw them every day during the covid pandemic. Well, they're not safe either. So here's a story from Fox Business explaining how people in Switzerland could be banned from using their electric cars when, when the country is facing an energy crunch. So the article starts off saying Switzerland could ban electric vehicles from being used non-essentially 
this winter as government officials begin to brace for an energy crisis during the winter months, according to reports. The Telegraph reported on Saturday that Swiss officials have drafted emergency proposals that restrict power usage if things get bad this winter. For example, shops uh, may need to reduce their hours, streaming services may need to be limited, and buildings may only be heated to 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Other bans, according to the De- Telegraph, may include concerts, theater perfor- performances, and sporting events to uh, all be canceled to prevent a blackout. So uh, Switzerland relies on a lot of hydro- uh, hydropower during the summer months, and a, they rely on a lot of energy imports during the winter months. So obviously we know what's going on worldwide that's causing this crunch, but as Chris kind of teased, these climate restrictions are really starting to look and sound familiar, aren't they? I mean, uh, what was the last time that you heard something deemed non-essential? Uh, what was the last time we we had public events being shut down, you know, for the for the greater good and all of that? It's almost as if COVID provided a roadmap for how mm-hmm. these people should, uh, you know, treat civilization, you know, when climate change rears its ugly head. Uh, Jim, you've been, you've been nice and silent for a while. You want to chime in on this story? Well, I, I'm struck by a comment by, uh, one of our viewers, Reese Reed, who says that's why they want us in electric cars so they can cut off our travel. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's, I was on a podcast actually yesterday. It's going to be, it's going to air on, uh, uh, Monday. It's called America out loud, uh, to, uh, Heartland affiliated people, Jay Lair and, and Tom Harris. And we talked about, uh, energy policy and fossil fuels and things like electric cars and that sort of thing. And uh, the one of the points that we were, you know, one of the points about this that we were talking about is that green energy cannot cannot uh, actually uh, power our modern world at all. There's no chance for it. And that's the point. The point is that we have too much prosperity, at least people in the West, at least ordinary people in the West. I got You have to keep making the caveat that the elites will always have what they want and and uh, will have no reduction in their own lifestyles. It happens every time, uh, you know, from the the Soviet Union where the elites had uh, all, the, all the luxuries that they wanted and the regular people suffered. This is the same kind of, uh, frankly, global regime that is being created via doing something about the climate crisis. And so the point, the point is that we won't have enough energy to go where we want. The point is that uh, if we're forced into electric cars, the vast majority of us will not be able to afford them. And that's where your coercion comes in. When you're the state of California and you pass a law banning the sale of an internal combustion engine vehicle starting in 20, I think 35, that is coercion. That is to make it so that you cannot Mm -hmm. afford your own personal transportation. The problem in, in the eyes of these climate cultists and power grabbing global elites is that you have too much freedom. And if you have a a boundless energy that is affordable, that allows you to do whatever you want, go where you want, heat your home to the, to the uh, level that you want it heated, stream as much as you feel like plugging in all of your electronic devices. If you have the freedom to do these things, you can't be controlled. All of this, all of this is to condition us, one, to get used to having a, 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 oh, I almost said it, a crappier standard of living and to make us all miserable so that we're a lot easier to control. That's what all of this is about. So the, the, the energy shortages you are seeing in Europe are the goal. It's not, it's a feature of these policies. It's not a bug. Yeah, I see a comment from Pitbull Mama that's talking about smart cities, dot, dot, horrifying. And, uh, you know, we didn't even really get into the concept of smart cities. Smart cities is a thing that's also being pushed by, uh, you know, people in the World Economic Forum. Again, on their website, they have whole sections of their website dedicated to this concept of smart cities. And we probably don't even have enough time to get into that in depth today, but we should because I've me and Justin personally have done a lot of research into smart cities and we could do a whole hour talking about that. And you're right. Horrifying. Uh, Justin, you want to, you want to chime in on this story, this Switzerland story, or just, uh, kind of all of this in, in, in general? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that what people have to keep in mind when they are seeing these kinds of stories is that these problems, whatever problems you're seeing with Russia and, uh, energy shortages related to the war with Russia and Ukraine and g- global, uh, all sorts of global energy problems uh, is nothing compared to the deliberate transformation that people on the left claim they want to make 
when it comes to our energy systems all over the world. Whatever problems you're seeing right now are a tiny fraction of the kinds of problems and shortages and concerns that are going to exist and potentials for blackouts and everything else that's going to exist if we really were to run mostly on solar panels when the sun doesn't always shine, wind farms when the wind isn't always blowing, batteries, which are not always reliable as they say, and you need to have millions and millions of them to run the entire country on energy oh, that's well, been stored in it. Oh, they admit that I mean, the battery storage uh, is not up to snuff at all. At all. Like they, they right. admit that. <laughs> so. Right. And so, and, and that's, and, and the transmission lines that you need to build through thousands of neighborhoods that don't want them and all the issues, right? Whatever these are, it, this is a tiny little fraction. So when people look at it and say, well, so, you know, the war in, war in Ukraine, like that's the reason why we have all these crazy things. It's like, yeah, that's, that's partially true. A lot of these problems could have been avoided had Europe just had common sense energy policies leading up to this. But even if we exclude that from the equation, just keep in mind the stuff that they're calling for by design, the Democratic Party and others in Europe is way bigger than what's going on with, with Russia and Ukraine. Way bigger. I know that's hard for people to understand that, but it's true because the amount of energy provided by Russia uh, is a is a is pales in comparison to the kinds of transformations that they're mm -hmm. actively advocating for. So right. th these problems are going to get worse if we continue to move in the direction of more unreliable energy sources. There is a reason. I know this is really hard for people who are on the left to understand to believe. But there is a reason why the energy system has been built the way it has. Sure. There's a reason why. And it's not based entirely on corruption and crony capitalism and all this other stuff. It's largely because these are the most reliable forms of energy. It's easy to ramp them up and ramp them down. If you can build them anywhere, you can build a natural gas plant basically anywhere, right? Nuclear, you can build just about anywhere. There's a reason why these things exist. And uh, the, the left wants to destroy it and replace it with an unreliable system. And this is the world that we're, this is a little, uh, I think it's a warning shot. If we keep going in the direction of unreliable energy, things are, look at what's happening to Europe right now, multiply mm -hmm. that by 10. That's what the entire Western world is facing. And it would be catastrophic. Chris, How I got, I, I, I got, I got another big facet of this conversation that I want to bring up, but uh, I'll give you the option. You can either have a first swing on the next thing or last words on this particular story. I, uh, you know, I'll just, uh, tie this one up. I think that what they've done is that they've created a crisis on purpose oh, because by, by creating the crisis, they can then implement their, you know, crazy, crazy pseudo solutions. Mm -hmm. So we actually don't have an energy crisis. We've got more than enough natural gas. We've got more than enough oil. We've got nuclear power. We've got tons and tons and tons of available. Yeah, we have a man-made energy crisis. Right. That's yeah. <laughs> it, it, right. Exactly. When Joe Biden came in office, what did he do on day one? He said, no Keystone XL pipeline. What has he done in the past you know, year and a half? He has you know, drastically reduced the amount of like, drilling on federal lands. We could go on and on and on. Uh, taxes and regulations. So they are purposefully stifling the production of cheap and affordable and you know accessible energy so that they can then say, well, we have to do this, you know, this green new deal type stuff. And it just so happens that they are the ones who are going to benefit from this because their donors are the ones who are, you know, in, in these industries. And guess what? Joe Biden and the, you know, people like him will never abide by the rules that they're trying to impl implement upon us. Yeah, there's a there's another article that uh, I'm just going to very quickly breeze over. If you want to check it out, everything we talk about is linked in the show notes. Uh, but there is an article here on The Blaze talking about how Gavin Newsom in California is proposing a civil penalty on oil companies. Quote, either big oil reigns in their profits or prices or they'll pay a penalty. So this just kind of goes to show that once a scapegoat is identified, nothing is off limits from these wannabe totalitarians. So. Uh, it's an interesting story, but I want to get to this this other one in the Daddy, remaining. May I make one very quick comment on this? Okay. If uh, if Gavin Newsom, uh, you know, the would be king of California, is so concerned about companies making massive profits, well, he should really be pissed at uh, companies like Google and Apple because their profit margins are gigantic. They <laughs> they dwarf almost any other industry. So why is he not coming down on the tech billionaires? 
and you know their their outrageous profits. It's it's yeah. it's it's just it's so frustrating because it's just so it, it it's 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 pure lies, sure. pure lies and propaganda. Yep. So the the thing that I want to uh, spend a little bit more time on is uh, this article from the Washington Post. And um, if you have watched the show long enough, you'll know that I hold population control as one of the all time despicable concepts out there. Uh, the choice to have a child is one of the most like sacred decisions a woman could make that that truly goes to like the, the depths of the soul of a potential mother. And to potentially rip that choice away from somebody, I, I can't even put into words uh, how horrid of a concept that, that that is. So forgive me if I'm sensitive when I see articles published by one of the largest newspapers out there, the Washington Post, with titles uh, reading... Should you not have kids because of climate change? It's complicated. So to the author's credit, uh, she does try to take a nuanced and, and mostly agnostic approach to the topic. But the article is just filled with a bunch of anti-human rhetoric. So they, hmm. they talk about an Oregon State University paper that estimates how uh, each, each child born will add thousands of tons of carbon dioxide to their parents' lifetime carbon legacy uh this idea of considering the the lifetime consumption of each new child having one fewer child is an emission reduction decision that dwarfs any other lifestyle choice that you can make whether that's choosing to own a car or using green energy or not flying or recycling religiously all of those dwarfed by the idea of not having a kid uh, so now, again, the author does bring balance and, and nuance to some of these things. But this topic just makes me think of a couple a couple kind of big, big things. The first one is that I feel like when you talk about this topic this way, it brings this decision into the realm of politics and policy. And suddenly it feels like Al Gore is going to be able to come in and weigh in on whether or not uh, on your decision of whether or not to have a kid. And like that, that alone, like grosses me out that, you know, you'll have Bernie Sanders uh, on that uh, seven hour long town hall on, on CNN talking about the importance of of uh, bringing, uh, um, you know, these choices to the forefront of mothers that are choosing to have kids or whatever. Uh, the second thing, and this might be even worse, and it just shows how like the terrible propaganda is causing women in this country and throughout the world to make decisions that they might not otherwise make. And potentially miss out on a lifetime of, of uh, you know, potential happiness and fulfillment because of a bunch of alarmists scared you enough to not make that decision. And then the last thing um, that I feel like this conversation brings up is that it, it starts to really tilt the scales of of looking at people um, like uh, by definition as a drain on society. A, a liability for society, mm -hmm. some type of uh, a burden that you're that you're bringing on to society just by being born. And that's opposed to, you know, the, the lifespan of humanity where a new person was always looked at as an asset to the culture and to the society and all of that. So this 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 kind of conversation flips that on its head. And all of those points that, that I make just like sicken me to my core. I was writing my notes for this. Uh, I was like 10 minutes into writing my notes for this specific segment and Justin calls me and I had to like, I had to like center myself because I was so heated about all the stuff that I was, I was reading about here. And again, it just like, it just absolutely grosses me out. Um, Jim, uh, I'll, I'll let you take first swing on this. The, the title of this podcast is, uh, you asked me for title ideas and this is the one I came up with one of several and you picked it, our dystopian green future. It's, this is our dystopian green present, actually, is what we're experiencing right now. I mean, this is laying the groundwork. As you said, in the Washington Post, of all, you know, one of the most prestigious newspapers in the world, suggesting, you know, just a little soft suggestion that, you know, you probably shouldn't have a family. Uh, and they really do. They really do think of, of human beings as a disease, like Agent Smith in, uh, uh, in The Matrix. We are a virus upon the earth. And right. uh, we need there needs to be a lot fewer of us. They and they believe this. And the scary part is, is that these radical leftists are in control of the most powerful institutions on this planet, from the World Economic Forum to the heads of governments in almost every country in Europe, to to our elites here in the United States, in Congress and elsewhere, to academia, to media. 
they they believe this stuff and they believe that humans are a plague on the earth. The the chart that Andy had up on the screen showed that by far, by orders of, of magnitude, the best thing you can do for the planet is to not have a child. Um, and in fact, it's they even said the stuff that we talked about earlier in this podcast, like getting rid of your car. There it is. You know, live car free is is uh, you reduce your metric tonnage of CO2 in the atmosphere by 2.4. Uh, whereas we're having one fewer child, you get a 58.6 score. Um, all of this ties into, again, you know, ESG and the idea of social credit scores. Do you think in the future, if social credit scores are a real thing, that you will have um, that it will harm or help your social credit score if you have a second child or a third child? Of course, it's going to hurt your social credit score. Um, this is this is dystopian. Uh, uh, this is horrifying. And this is being mainstreamed in thought among among our elites. And now it's filtering down into into the media people consume, where people will start to think to themselves, yeah, you know, I probably shouldn't have uh, another kid. Or, or they'll look askance at their sister or their cousin or their neighbor who now has their fifth or fourth kid. Um, and they will socially ostracize these people. This is evil stuff, man. That is evil to, to perpetuate this kind of thing. And actually good on Elon Musk. He says that what we have, the, uh, the biggest problem to humanity is that we're not making enough kids. That, he right. says, is the biggest problem right now. And so that's what makes me think he's a, one of the clearest thinkers out there in the among the global elite. Yeah, I mean, uh, Ju Justin knows <laughs> Justin knows my interest in this population control thing. Uh, Justin, you remember a, a couple of things that I routinely bring up. One of them was a it was a letter signed by like eleven thousand scientists. This is from f about three years ago. Grabbed a whole lot of attention because it was eleven thousand scientists signed onto this letter talking about how climate change is 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 going to be terrible and how we have to act now. And what most of the stories left out was a couple of paragraphs talking about populations. And uh, at one point, they, they talked about how global population, quote, must be stabilized and ideally gradually reduced within a framework that ensures social integrity. And they also refer to human population growth as a, quote, profoundly troubling sign. And then uh, there was also another part of, of the same letter that labels economic and population growth as, quote, an important drivers of increases in CO2 emissions. So, again, this this letter being heralded all across these these uh, news sites talking about all these scientists getting together. There's there's population control language in it. There's anti-human rhetoric in that letter. And then the other one that I always like to bring up. Uh, is that one study or analysis that was uh, that was authored by like, oh man, what was it? It was like Georgetown or something, a bunch of uh, like three different academics from a couple of like more prestigious uh, universities. And they talked about like what we could do to limit population control across a a spectrum of coercion. And on the most the most non coercive side was choice enhancement. And I think we all know what choice enhancement was. And then the next level was uh, was basically propaganda. Like we just need this message of you're going to be happier with less kids put out in TV and movies and billboards and school plays and stuff. I'm not even exaggerating. And then the third level was incentivization. And maybe we can tweak the tax code to make it more beneficial to not have kids. And then the fourth section on the, the furthest on the end of this spectrum of coercion was like China's one child policy type things, which they made very clear that they were not advocating for. But when they made it very clear that they weren't advocating for that, they kind of, uh, you know, you can insinuate that they were advocating for the other three or at least thought that those were morally fine. Um, so, Justin, I, again, I could talk all day about this stuff. But uh, what do you what do you have to say when you see an article like this in The Washington Times or sorry, Washington Post? At, at its foundation, this idea is, I, I think if you're going to you trace it back to sort of the genesis of where this sort of mindset comes from, I think it really does come from a collective, a collectivist first mindset. It really does stem from sort of Marxism and socialism and that whole school of thought. And as that's become increasingly more popular and become increasingly less uh, tied to religion because there was a period of time in the progressive era where sort of progressive ideas and socialist ideas were being merged with, with Christian ideas, at least in America. 
And that puts some guardrails on how far collectivism can go, right? You, you want collectivism, but collectivism has to at least be to some extent to help people. That's the focus of this, individual people. And people are not bad, and more people could be a good thing. But as it became, as the progressive movement and as the socialist movement in the West became less tied to religion and more focused on just sort of a secular view of that, uh, the natural outflow of that is, well, if our focus is how do we make life better for the collective, then you can see how adding more people to the collective makes the problem bigger, right? So if you already have a problem with poverty and you've got more people in poverty having kids, that's a bigger problem. If you already need to feed people and you've got more mouths to feed, that's a problem. If you need to pay for healthcare for everybody and now more people need healthcare, that's a problem. Whereas on the opposite side, when you have a free market and right. you have a focus on individual rights, these are not problems. Exactly. These are good. These are actually good things because these are more people with more ideas, more innovation, more entrepreneurship, uh, more decentralization of thought and, and experimentation and all of these other things. And so for me, foundationally, even though nobody is consciously, very few people are consciously thinking about these things in this way, I really do think that the the foundation of all of this is the idea of do we put the emphasis on collective first or do we put the emphasis on every individual life matters first? Those mm. are the two competing ideologies, really. And that's where all of this goes off the rails. The moment you say, well, I put the collective first. Follow that logically. We don't want the collective bigger then until we solve all the problems. If we solve all the problems, then maybe the collective can get bigger then, but right. only in a way that, but, but that's, and this is exactly why China has had historically a one child policy, a two child policy. You know, this is why they do these kinds of, why? Because their problems were getting bigger. We need to get the problem smaller. And so I really think that uh, it's a missed opportunity to talk about these things and not emphasize that, you know, again, logically, we talked about climate change and the logical outflow of having a sort of catastrophic view of climate change. The logical outflow of putting the collective above everything else is you end up with this. And yeah. I think that's a really important thing people got to keep in mind. Yeah, no, it is, uh, it is absolutely wild. Uh, Chris, uh, pop population control. Uh, <laughs> what do you, what do you think when you see so pro or or con, Chris. <laughs> well, let me Feel think about that devil. for a minute. <laughs> you know, you know, here. you know, well, Donnie, I, I, I mean, AOC said that the world's going to end in 12 years anyway. So why are we even debating any of this stuff? I mean, aren't we like, aren't we like eight years away from like the end of the world? Like, why do we even care? But on a, on a serious note, I think, um, Justin really, really nailed this one. Uh, I think that this is the classic uh, air of uh, Marxism, socialism, collectivism in general. They think that everything's a zero sum game and they think that the economy yep. is a is a, um, it, it, it's a it's a pie that that is not able to grow, that it's that it's, you know, it's the same and it has to be distributed. And if it's distributed amongst more people, then everyone's going to smaller slice of the pie, as Justin said, in America and in the West. And, you know, uh, what we've learned is. Actually, if you have a free market economy and you let people just, you know, do their thing and you let them innovate and start a business, you know, you've got people like Henry Ford who do things and, we, you know, all have cars or, you know, you've got uh, people who Alexander Graham Bell and we can all communicate together. So the more the, the more people you have, the more opportunities you have for innovation, entrepreneurship and groundbreaking technologies. So I really don't understand why they are hellbent on, uh, you know, on their degrowth depopulation movement but it makes sense if you if you understand their point of view which is everything's finite and i i don't view everything as finite i view everything as well you know what human innovation can overcome you know uh if we we're going to run out of oil in you know 200 years because we can come up with cold fusion or whatever so i just think it's a fundamental difference in uh the understanding of like what humans are capable of and they want to implement their their framework upon the rest of us instead of just saying hey you know what go and you know be prosperous and wealth will be created and the more people there are and the more ideas that you know are in in churning in the economy the more opportunities for uh, economic innovation and prosperity yeah, yeah just you know, one, just one 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 quick thing on that the 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 proof of this theory being true is the entire history of human civilization 
when you had very few people in the beginning and things were really bad. And then over time, we have more people and things get progressively better. And the more people we've had, the better things have gotten overall. And see, things keep getting better even though we keep having more people. That That is proof of it. So, I think that the other side should have to disprove thousands and thousands of years of empirical evidence if we're going to adopt that approach and they can't possibly do it. Yeah, you know, uh, I've brought up the World Economic Forum a handful of times already, and I'm going to bring it up one more time because this is kind of the underlying principle of a lot of their ideas is this kind of this reversal of, of how you consider humans uh, a liability or an asset. So we have a video here. This seems to be an, a little bit of an older clip, but it, it still represents uh, the views of this gentleman. Uh, this is Yuval Harari, which is considered one of the kind of uh, right hand mans of Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum. And in this clip, he is talking about what the future of humanity looks like for an individual. Uh, so let's go ahead and play, play this clip. What we're talking about now is like a second industrial revolution, but the product this time will not be textiles or machines or vehicles or even weapons. The product this time will be humans themselves. We are basically learning to produce bodies and minds. This time, if you're not part of the revolution fast enough, then you probably become, become extinct. Once you know how to produce bodies and brains and minds, so cheap labor in Africa or South Asia or wherever, it, it simply counts for nothing. And again, I think that the biggest question, in, in maybe in economics and politics of the coming decades, will be what to do with all these useless people. I don't useless think people. we have an economic model to, for that. The problem is more uh, boredom and how, what to do with them and how will they find some sense of meaning in life when they are basically meaningless, worthless. My best guess at present is a combination of drugs and computer games. <laughs> so that's right. <laughs> Vast majority of people, meaningless, useless to the society. How, how are they gonna, how are they gonna avert their own boredom? Well, we'll just drug them up and let them play video games. This is the mindset of this global elitist type that are at the forefront of this great reset that are at the forefront of all this climate alarmism. When you when you take away all of the marketing uh, uh, schemes that they, they try to sell this to the general public, if you strip away all of the frills and and uh, you know good sounding sound bites, that's the message right there. It's the idea that you are a liability on society and that you need to limit your car travel, you need to limit your uh, uh, carbon footprint, you need to only buy three items of clothing a year, and you better be happy about it. Uh, Jim? I'll give you last words and then we're going to wrap up the episode. Well, I mean, I think one of the things he said there is he, he was just confounded. How could somebody find meaning in life? These useless people, if we have uh, everything automated and we're building brains or, you know, I'm sure he means artificial intelligence that he just, cause he's so, these people are so collectivist as, as Justin was talking about, they're so collectivist in their thinking. It doesn't occur to them that an individual who is alive with a soul with a, can find his own purpose in life and has a right to live it as he sees fit. It doesn't even cross his mind that mm -hmm. that is a possibility in the future because we have a collectivist future in his mind. And if you're not part of the second industrial revolution in which you are advancing the goals of the collective, if you are an individualist, you are worthless. You are a worthless, yeah. you're a useless eater. And how could you possibly find any purpose in life? And so we'll just have to either drug you up so that uh, you don't bother us and give you video games or maybe worse. Well, uh, Donnie, you know that I just read Homo Deus, which is uh, Yuval Harari's book. And Jim, actually, uh, throughout the book, and this is a major point that he makes, humans don't have souls. We're just algorithms. And no kidding. So he would, he, would, he would reject the entire premise that humans have souls because according to him, we're just, you know, uh, neurons firing in it. And, and if we yeah, can have a non-conscious, yeah, if we can have a non-conscious algorithm that can uh, better organize society or make decisions better for us, then he is all for it. So, yeah. so well, we, we can, this, is, we this can, is the tip of the iceberg for this guy. We're going to have to do a, a World Economic Forum dedicated episode talking all about Yuval Harari. I also read Please. that book, too. Um, yeah. And and the smart cities we will get into all of it. Uh, but we're going to have to save that for a future episode because we are out of time and i just want to thank everyone for joining us for this episode of the in the tank podcast 
If you are hearing this on a Friday or later, you could always join us a day earlier on Thursdays at noon central time where we're streaming on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble and Twitter. You can join the conversation, throw your comments and questions in the stream there. Maybe we'll show your comments on the screen. Maybe we'll address your questions on the fly. Also, like I mentioned, we are shifting this show over to Stopping Socialism TV on YouTube. So if you are listening to the audio only, nothing's going to change. You're going to be able to find the podcast in the same spot that you always have. But if you're watching that video version on YouTube, join us on Stopping Socialism TV. That's where it's going to be housed permanently after the first of the new year. And also, uh, if you want to help our show grow, you could always hit that subscribe button, leave a review for the podcast if you're listening to the audio only. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that share button, hit that subscribe if you haven't already, leave a comment underneath the video. All things that help break through that big tech algorithm that prevents content like this from being shown to more people. If you'd like, you can follow us on Twitter at In the Tank Pod. And if you have any comments or questions for the show, feel free to email us at In the Tank Podcast at gmail.com. Jim Lakely, where can the fine people find you? At Jay Lakely on Twitter, at Heartland Inst on Twitter, and always visit heartland.org. Justin Haskins, same question. At Justin T. Haskins on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Parlor, and everything else. Fantastic. And Chris, what do you have to pitch today? Stoppingsocialism.com. Got some great new articles up there. And uh, for anyone who hasn't checked it out, please look at our 2022 socialist watch list and look at how the socialists performed in the uh, midterms elections. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild stuff. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. We will talk to you next week.